ਸਤਿ ਸ਼੍ਰੀ ਅਕਾਲ ਦੋਸਤੋ ਮੈਂ ਹਾਂ ਪਪਿੰਦਰ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਦੇਖ ਰਹੇ ਹੋ ਜਸ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਤੇ ਸਵਾਗਤ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਇਸ ਸ਼ੋਅ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਦੋਸਤੋ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਹੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਜਦ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਕ ਦੂਜੇ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਉਂਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਜਦ ਅਸੀਂ ਇੱਕ ਵੱਖਰੇ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਆਉਂਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਇਨਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਹਮੇਸ਼ਾ ਰਹਿੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਕੀ ਉੱਥੇ ਦੇ ਲਾਸ ਕੀ ਉੱਥੇ ਦੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਮੇਰਾ ਸਾਥ ਦੇਣਗੇ ਕਿ ਕੁਝ ਇਦਾਂ ਤਾਂ ਹੋਤਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਾਏਗਾ ਕਿ ਮੈਂ ਇੰਨਾ ਆਪਣਾ ਫਾਈਨੈਂਸ਼ੀਅਲ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਇਨਵੈਸਟਮੈਂਟ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਸਾਰੀ ਵੇਸਟ ਹੋ ਜਾਵੇ ਕੀ ਮੈਂ ਉੱਥੇ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਬਿਨਾ ਕਿਸੇ ਡਰ ਦੇ ਰਹਿ ਸਕਦਾ ਹਾਂ ਇਹ ਸਾਰੀਆਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਕਵਰ ਹੁੰਦੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਇਨ ਇਮੀਗ੍ਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਲਾਸ ਤੇ ਅੱਜ ਅਸੀਂ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਾਂਗੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਵਿਦ ਦ ਲਾਇਰਸ ਫਰਮ ਬ੍ਰੈਟਸ ਐਂਡ ਕੋਵਨ ਐਲ ਐਲ ਪੀ ਹਾਈ ਐਲੀਨ ਐਂਡ ਹੈਲੋ ਕੈਰੀ ਹਾਊ ਆਰ ਯੂ ਡੂਇੰਗ ਟੂਡੇ ਵੈਰੀ ਵੈਲ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਹਾਈ ਬੀ ਕੇ ਥੈਂਕਸ ਫॉर ਹੈਵਿੰਗ ਅਸ well the pleasure is all mine and i am glad you are here every week and to talk to us about all the immigration laws that are beneficial to us and how can we handle the immigration problems that we have so thanks to you too um i'll start with the procedure for the green card last time uh, last week we talked about conditional green cards and um other ways through which we can actually be legalized if we are here through the other ways if we are not here legally um if somebody is already having a green card and they go back to india stays there and have a baby what's the status of that baby well if they return back to the united states within 2 years of that birth that child comes here with a green card um it all takes place at the port of entry So when they come into the United States, uh the immigration officer that they see as they enter um th- should know what to do, but they need to say I'm a lawful permanent resident returning with my infant child and I w- and the child wants lawful permanent resident status. Everything's taking place at the airport. If they're a little concerned because you will need a visa to come to the United States, they can also go to the US embassy. and uh inquire there. Sure. And um if somebody is ha- uh, a US citizen and they have petitioned for their wife and a baby is born through that marriage, what should they do for the baby like uh, is the inter- if the interview is already done and they're already in the procedure of coming to US, uh, what can be the different scenarios for that baby born in India? Well, if the father who is the uh, biological father and married to the mother of the child, it's very simple. Um he just has to show that he is the father. Uh he's a United States citizen and that he has to show he's been in the United States for at least a period of 5 years, maybe 10 depending on the year of his birth after the age of 14. So, if he's able to show he's a US citizen, and he's resided in the United States for at least that 5 or 10 year period before his child is born the child acquires US citizenship at birth and that would be taken care of at the uh, US consulate abroad then you could file for a birth abroad certificate sure anything um, to add to that nope that's correct <laughs> <laughs> that's correct uh, we got this question through the email and um, they want to know that the whole family came uh, had got a green card from the asylum case when they came here mother became citizen one day before the kids 18th birthday so what should they do for the petition for uh, the naturalization of kids well um we're referring to what's called derivative uh citizenship and there are essentially uh, two laws uh, let's say the old law which refers to people who were uh 18 or under before February of 2001 and then the new law for people after that. So assuming it's under the new law, all you need in order to automatically derive citizenship from the naturalization of one parent is to show that you have lived with that parent. That's it. And you will derive naturalization. Under the old immigration law, it is far more complicated. Basically, uh if the parents were married, both parents would need to have naturalized before the person turned 18 unless there was a legal separation or divorce in which case then the custodial parent needed to do it and this becomes really important uh sometimes where uh you talk about this whole family they they've been here maybe the younger child didn't become a citizen uh or didn't apply to become a citizen and later gets convicted of some 
deportable crime for which there is no waiver. Well, then you look back to see, is it possible that mom or dad naturalized before he turned 18 and maybe by operation of law, without having filed any papers, he became a citizen or automatically became a citizen. And that's a great deportation defense. So looking at those dates become really important. And um, let's suppose if somebody wants to apply for their parents, uh, can they do anything while they're just a green card holder? No. Mm, not, not, and if they just want them to visit? <laughs> that's a good question for you, Eileen. Uh, no, in order to be able to petition for a parent, uh, the only person who can petition for a parent is a U.S. citizen. Um, now, having them come for a visit, really that's a done at the consulate. Um, and while they can request them to come here for a visit, immigration is probably going to ask a lot of questions. One of them might be well, where you know, their children might reside and what their status is in the United States. And if immigration believes that they may enter the United States with no intention of leaving, more likely than not, those visas would be denied, those tourist visas. Um, but immigration has given out tourist visas for people to come and, and see their family, provided they can show that they have a lot of ties back in their home country. So if they own property, if they have bank accounts, if they have current jobs, that all helps them to get a tourist visa. Under the immigration law, everybody applying to come to the U.S., whether they're applying to come permanently or as a visitor, is presumed to want to be an immigrant, is presumed under the law to live here until they prove otherwise. So somebody coming to the U.S., uh, looking to come to the U.S., let's say with a tourist visa, who has a way or will have a way to get a green card, that adds to that presumption. Um, and, but you can overcome it. Some lawyers have a theory that if, you know, they write a really strong letter, we, gee, we want you to come for, uh, you know, uh, the birth of our child or something like that, or we'd like you to come for our anniversary or for some special event or wedding, that that helps. Um, it, it certainly doesn't hurt. Uh, but if it's something that's made up and the consulate gets any wind that this is nonsense, it's, it's not going to help at all. All right. Um, and we talked about asylum last time. And uh, if a family is here and they got the green card from the case of asylum, now the son got arrested because of the use of uh, illegal drugs. What, will that affect the whole family in that procedure, or will the son be deported? Great question. Uh, first of all, it won't affect the whole family, um, but uh, possession of a controlled substance, possession with intent to distribute, uh, all of those are deportable offenses with one minor exception. Simple possession of less than 30 grams of marijuana is not deportable, but it's a very small amount. And so if it's anything other than marijuana, cocaine, ecstasy, um, something like that, the person becomes deportable. The question is, is there a waiver of deportation? So with controlled substances, there is no waiver if it is trafficking, if it is possession with intent, sale, attempted sale, conspiracy to possess with intent to sell. All of those require some movement of the drug, no waiver, deportation will, for lack of a better term, will be automatic. If it is simple possession uh, and the person has lived here for seven years prior to the uh, deportable offense and has a green card for five years, there's a waiver of deportation called cancellation of removal, where an immigration judge will look at the person's whole life, balance the good things in their life against the bad. So the bad is the criminal history, in this case the first offense, uh, the good is how long they've been here, especially if they came at a young age. Did the person come when they were 30 or did they come when they were two years old? Uh, what family they have here, what kind of hardship they or the family would suffer, rehabilitation, and work history or school history. And then make a decision as to what's, uh, whether the person deserves a waiver and what's in the best interest of the United States. So, so a, a person who's been here for many years, 10, 15 years, one simple marijuana uh, conviction and uh, is otherwise uh, has been going to school or working, family ties, probably a good case for cancellation or removal. 
So uh, what if it's not just a position of marijuana, maybe it's some financial fraud as well? I love financial fraud. Okay, so financial fraud is really complicated. Fraud, of course, is going to be, any kind of fraud is going to be something called a crime involving moral turpitude which might be a deportable offense as well, depending upon when it was committed in relationship to when you came to the U.S. But financial fraud generally is not prosecuted unless there is a loss of greater than 10000 And guess what? Immigration has a ground of deportation called aggravated felony for crimes involving fraud or deceit where there's a loss of greater than 10000 and there is no waiver of deportation in those cases. So if someone who is living here legally, illegally, asylum, green card, but not a citizen, and they now have an open criminal case, the time to strategize the deportation defense is at the same time you're strategizing the criminal defense. It costs extra to bring on an immigration lawyer, but sometimes a slight variation on the crime or the plea that the person takes could make all the difference in the world for whether or not they're deportable or eligible for a waiver. Definitely. Good we'll questions. Talk. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> well, we'll t definitely <laughs> talk more about these, but right now it's time to take a short break. So don't go anywhere. Keep watching. Just Punjabi. We'll be right back. Welcome back. So another fair to swagat pyar deya. Main hapa pindar tosi dekh rahe ho. Just Punjabi. The is show the through. Asi thono dekha rahe hain ki kis tarikhe na tosi handle kar sakde ho. Apne immigration the cases ya ki thode scenarios ne tosi sanu email karke vidha sakde ho. Bk at justbroadcasting dot com ya fir tosi info at justbroadcasting dot com the bhi email kar sakde ho. Hot jankari lei je tosi gal karna chande ho lawyers the naal from Brits and Co and LLP. ਤੁਸੀਂ ਦਿੱਤੇ ਗਏ ਨੰਬਰਸ ਤੇ ਕਾਲ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਹੋ ਨੰਬਰਸ ਤੁਹਾਡੀ ਟੀਵੀ ਸਕਰੀਨ ਤੇ ਨੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਵੈਬਸਾਈਟ ਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਈਮੇਲ ਐਡਰੈਸਸ ਤੇ ਵੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਈਮੇਲ ਕਰਕੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਸਵਾਲ ਪੁੱਛ ਸਕਦੇ ਹੋ ਲੈਟਸ ਕੰਟੀਨਿਊ ਵਿਦ ਆਰ ਸ਼ੋ ਵੀ ਹੈਵ ਇਨ ਆਰ ਸਟੂਡੀਓ ਅ ਵੈਰੀ ਬਿਊਟੀਫੁਲ ਆਈਲੀਨ ਐਂਡ ਕੈਰੀ ਡੈਫੀਨਿਟਲੀ ਐਂਡ ਵੀ ਵਰ ਟਾਕਿੰਗ ਅਬਾਊਟ ਡਿਫਰੈਂਟ ਇਮੀਗ੍ਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਲਾਸ ਥੈਟ ਆਰ देयर ਬਟ ਵਾਟ ਇਫ ਸਮਬਡੀ ਇਜ਼ ਆਲਰੇਡੀ ਅ ਸਿਟੀਜ਼ਨ ਬਟ ਆਫਟਰ ਹੀ ਗਾਟ ਦ ਸਿਟੀਜ਼ਨਸ਼ਿਪ ਐਂਡ ਸੂਨ ਗਾਟ ਕਨਵਿਕਟਡ ਆਫ ਅ ਕ੍ਰਾਈਮ ਹੀ ਡਿਡ ਬਿਫੋਰ ਹੀ ਗਾਟ ਸਿਟੀਜ਼ਨਸ਼ਿਪ will is he still safe and is he still a citizen or is there some way he would his naturalization will be cancelled or something it's a great question bk there is a process for denaturalization it's extremely complicated and it is usually used where a person committed fraud on the application so uh sometimes people lie on the application about all kinds of things they don't reveal all their children because it might lead to questioning marriage fraud but there is a question on the naturalization application that reads something like have you committed any crimes that you haven't yet been arrested for and so take the case of uh, what we're talking about here and we're talking about medical fraud during the break so someone who worked let's say in a a, a medical facility for a couple of years she quit she now naturalizes and now after naturalizing she gets indicted based upon activity she did before she naturalized. So it is conceivable for immigration to begin a denaturalization process, but it is very, very rare. They have a they have a second process which is not denaturalization, but where they take back the passport and the certificate of naturalization. So it's an administrative process. It's easy for the government. They don't have the burden of going to federal court. But it's not clear under the law what status it leaves you in. And we had a number of cases where a person who worked for immigration, an examiner, was indicted, convicted, and went to jail for many years because he was flagging cases where people couldn't pass the English portion of the exam. And then he had a broker approach these people and said, file again. For a fee, they flagged the files, and they put down uh, like these people were truly interviewed and that they took the exam, and they weren't. And later on, immigration took back their passports when they traveled or customs and border patrol did that and they had to go through an administrative process to try to get the, uh, their passports back now this is a relatively new process um, and how it's ultimately going to play out we don't know but yes you could conceivably if you lie on the application have a problem later on and what if the crime was um 
happen, crime happened after uh, the process of naturalization. After you naturalize your home free, commit whatever crimes you want to commit, you're not going to have an immigration problem. Okay. <laughs> you may um, have another problem, <laughs> but not immigration. Not immigration problem. You'll probably end up in jail for the rest of your life, but you will not go you back. You won't be deported. deported. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, raises a very interesting question, and I have to check the answer to this if we have the treaty with India. Some people who are serving very long sentences would prefer to serve their time in their home country. And I'm, I, I'm going to check for the next show. Uh, we have treaties with many countries which allow people, let's say you get sentenced to 20 years in jail, to serve your sentence back home in India or wherever. And I have to see if India is one of the countries we have a treaty for. Well, definitely, and I will wait for that answer. <laughs> um, well, wherever the, you're serving the sentence, you will still be in jail. Yeah. So it's better that you do not commit any crimes. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Um, this person has asked in the email that um, his brother owns a store back in India, which is also his store and is a part of the business that he's doing here in U.S. Is there any way he can actually file a petition for his brother through this bus uh, joint business that they are doing? Yes, quite possibly. Um, that would be a an employment-based question. Uh, they. CIS offers what's called an L1A. It's an intercompany manager executive uh, transfer. So as long as he's either a manager or he's an executive with the company, depending on the type of company it is, he can transfer to the United States and work in the U.S. St store or company. Uh, there are some requirements. The owner of the uh, foreign com company also has to be the owner of the U.S. company. And the beauty about this visa is not only does uh, the brother in this case come, his wife and children under 21 also come. His wife is entitled to work authorization. And this visa is um, renewable for seven years. So this is seven years of being in the United States where both parties get to, both husband and wife would uh, ultimately be able to work. Children would be able to go to school. And this visa allows you also to be eligible to receive um, a green card through PERM, through the same exact job. You just need to make sure you show that you've worked in India, in the company in India, for at least one of the last three years prior to coming to the United States or applying for this visa. And when you do come to the United States, you have to be in a managerial or an executive position. So you, you basically would want to show the organizational chart for the company, show that you manage a few people, the more the better and uh, the family gets to come to the United States. So uh, let's suppose uh, somebody after watching this show try, thought that, okay, this can be a good way of uh, getting my brother here. And the business that is owned by the brother, they go and they change the ownership. For how long they, could, they will have to wait to get through this procedure? Um, well, the process is fairly quick, so if they were going to file it, uh, even though he's abroad, they, they'd be having the interview abroad, you're looking at within six months they could have an interview abroad. Um, with immigration, the application that you file with CIS can be expedited. You pay what's called a premium processing fee, and you could file it with a request for a decision within 15 days. I'm curious um, to know, I, I thought this would clarify what, what BK might have, might have been asking. The brother in India, does he have to own 100% of the business in U.S., or can he own a percentage of it? No, the, the key here is that whoever owns either company has to own the same percentage of it. So the brothers could be partners, but the company that's owned in the U.S. has to have like the same uh, basic makeup. So if they, they own 50-50, it should be 50-50 in the United States. If it was 40-60, it should be the same in the United States. It really shouldn't have a third party in the U.S. Not, not to say that it couldn't happen. It could, but it, immigration has been a little bit more difficult on those type of uh, cases. They look at the difference in the ownership over time and then they could deny it. And we have seen that too, where ultimately it will be approved and later on be denied if there's a change in ownership. Or at the time that they go for their green card, they may, they may deny that application. So you want to keep things, um, you want to make sure that nobody is contradicting the other. So you want to keep everything the same for the immigration process. Um, let's suppose it's not a company, it's just a store. 
uh, back in India that is owned by the brother there. Let's say it's a clothing store, mm -hmm. and he owns the same clo same type of clothing store here. Is it still possible? Uh, yes, again, he would just have to show that he's managing other people. Um, when I say a company, it doesn't have to be a large company like a tele telecommunications company or, uh, you know, a, a, where it has multiple branches. You know, if you open up a small clothing store, you, you're probably going to incorporate it, and that would be your company, in my, in my words. So it could be an individual store. Um, it could be something as minor as a you know a newspaper stand if it was something large enough that it would have multiple employees <laughs> oh well, that's great and before we wind up today's show are there any new programs that are coming well since we are not seeing any uh, the comprehensive law still coming so are there any uh, short programs or any small programs that are coming out um, well, there's still, uh, there's a couple of things that have been in play, you know, that we've spoken about on previous shows, DACA and the provisional waiver. But just recently, I shouldn't say too recently, but they've had a new policy memo recently that said um, for those people who are already on uh, optional practical training, which is after their uh, student visas are completed, they've uh, gotten their degree, people get work authorization for 12 months and it's the uh, optional practical training period. Uh, it allows people time to uh, develop their skills and possibly get a job in the United States. Well, those have been extended for an additional 15 months for a total of uh, 27 months for those people with, uh, those professionals in the science field, mathematics, um, engineering, uh, technology. Those uh, degrees will allow you to get a 27-month work authorization after you complete your degree. It's very exciting. Uh, those professionals have a wonderful opportunity. It, they've been given more than nearly a year and a half uh, extension on their time in the United States, and it gives them opportunity as well as the United States a better opportunity to employ them for a longer period of time. Well, that's definitely great to know, and I'm sure whoever is watching this show will and who can benefit with these things will definitely call you. And if you have any type of questions regarding immigration, you can definitely call the numbers on <coughs> your TV screen and contact Brits and Cohen LLP. And they do speak Punjabi, Hindi, Urdu, and Bang Bengali as well. If you speak Bengali. So do contact them. Thank you so much for coming to our studio. Thank you. And thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you here. <coughs> and thank you so much for watching our show. Keep watching Just Punjabi. Thank you so much. Such a